word this morning when you're ready. Please open your Bibles to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I'll be honest with you, every Sunday morning I, I wake up almost always without an alarm. And uh, the reason for it is because I go to bed Saturday night just thinking about uh, thinking about the resurrection and about meeting with the believers and worshiping as a body and just really look forward to uh, just being here. And it's it used to be that way when I'd go fishing. Uh, <laughs> you know, anybody that's serious about going fishing knows you, you need to leave about 4 o'clock in the morning if you want to get somewhere and be there when the fish start biting in the morning. And it used to be if I was going fishing that... I just couldn't sleep the night before. I'd just be up all night thinking about where I'm going fishing and all that. And uh, I didn't ever, I always set an alarm because I was afraid I wouldn't wake up. But I never needed my alarm. About 15 minutes before 4 30, I'd finally just get out of bed and go. And, uh, you know, I need an alarm to go fishing anymore. <laughs> but I don't need an alarm normally to get up on Sunday morning. And certainly not this Sunday morning. It doesn't matter how tired I am. I just. Uh, it's, this is just the greatest thing that's ever happened. And again, that's an understatement about it. I want to read, if you'll permit, a long text of the Scripture today, but it's a story type of a text. It tells the story of the morning of the resurrection. And if you would please just imagine in your mind, just imagine, see the landscape and the way that things lay out and happen as the story of the resurrection is told. And if you'll do that, I, the text won't seem so long, and you'll be able to be really excited about it. Uh, Ashley, you want Andrew to go to, to, with the, with the other kids? There we go. Miss Angela will take him. All right, he's he's off and away. It's fine to have kids in the, in the service, but they'll probably get more back there because it's at their age level. The teaching. We when we send our kids back to junior church or back to the uh, to the nursery, we're not trying to get them out of the service. We're just wanting them to have church at their level. And that's where they learned it, about church. You can hear back there having their song service and everything this morning. And eventually they're going to get kicked out of there and they'll have to come and hear me preach like you folks do. But uh, until then, it's what it is. So we're going to read our text this morning in John chapter 20. If you found it and you notice that someone around you doesn't have a copy of the Scripture, uh, feel free just to hand them your Bible or grab a copy of the Scripture and to open it up so that everyone can look at what the Word of God says here today. Ready? Now let's read the first three words together and just stop there for a second. Okay, you ready? The first, first day. day. Well, if you read further, you'd see first day of the week. But what day is it today? First the first day. day of the week. Okay, so I'm going to keep reading. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone <clears throat> taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they've laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher, and stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulchre and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him thence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I'll take him away. 
Jesus saith unto her, Mary. And she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to, unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that He had spoken these things unto her. Father, please help us with our understanding of the Scripture today. And please, God, help us to understand the implications of the resurrection. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. There's not a more pertinent or interesting topic to anyone in the world than the matter of life after death. That's really what resurrection is, isn't it? Resurrection is coming back from the dead. And truthfully, that's actually a matter that not only is it interesting to us, could we say that there isn't a more important topic for a person in their life to be made aware of and to settle what's going to happen after death than the matter of life after death? Can you think of anything more important than life after death? There really isn't anything, is there? You know, when I read through Ecclesiastes where Solomon, toward the end of his life, writes about all the things that people live for and describes everything that people live for as vanity or as empty or useless. And he said something like this. He said, everything under the sun, that is everything on earth or everything in life, is vanity. It's all vanities. It's vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And it describes everything that people are living for and said it's worthless. And the reason it doesn't have lasting value or it's a vanity is because when you die, it's over. Listen, you have a great career. It's great while you're having the career. But when you no longer have it, it's over and it was just vanity. Listen, you have a lot of fun, you enjoy things, you do the things that you enjoy most. Everybody's different in the things they enjoy. Some people enjoy travel. Some people enjoy entertainment. Uh, some people enjoy music. Uh, some people enjoy interaction, fellowship, and relationships. Some people enjoy thrills. But when it's over, my friend, it doesn't matter anymore. You know, Life circumstances oftentimes, especially being a preacher, remind me of how much vanity there is in life. I don't like to speak about this, but it, death happens. This Friday or Saturday morning, the street in front of uh, one street out from my house was cordoned off because someone was crossing the street at five in the morning and was struck by a, run, a hit and run driver. And as I was looking at a tennis shoe, and as I was looking at, and I don't want to be descriptive, but looking at a yellow uh, covering over a body laying there, my thought was that person had no idea. They had no idea moments before that everything they were doing that day and everything they'd done in their life would no longer matter seconds later. Just like that. You know, it isn't that way for each of us. We don't know how much time we have, how much our days under the sun are going to be lived in certain ways. But let me tell you something, friend. Life after death is important. It's a big deal, isn't it? Being somewhere forever or having eternal life is a big deal. And for that reason, the resurrection, that is Jesus coming back from the dead, and the implications of the resurrection are not only the most interesting thing that you and I could examine and think about, but they're the most important things that you could think about or examine. I know folks that don't want to think about important things as vital as they are, and I think that the reason for it, I don't know the hearts of every person, but I think the reason that people don't like to think about it is because maybe they don't come up with thoughts or conclusions 
that either fit what they want to think or that answer the questions that they have. I remember a really, really nice elderly gentleman confronting me on the street. I think this would be back in the year 2006 or 2007. In, in, in absolute fury, absolutely enraged, and came up to me, and I couldn't figure out what he was angry about, but what he was angry about was that two ladies had asked him if he had eternal life. I mean, he was mad. I remember he was in the, in the Coral Ridge neighborhood over off of US-1, and we were just going through the neighborhoods of folks in our church, inviting people to come to church, and asking them the simple question, do you know that you have eternal life? It's the question we were asking. Now, is there anything offensive about the question, do you know if you have eternal life? Yes, there is. It's an extremely offensive question to some folks. <clears throat> and I remember I was talking to a guy that was very interesting to me. He was, uh, what's the latest fighter jet? The, the, the F, uh, is it the F-8? F-35. F-35? Okay. Did that one come out around 6 or 7 or around that time frame? It would be the F-22 probably. Yeah, it would be F-22. That's what it was. So this guy is flying, he's flying an F-22 and he also flew the air shows for the U.S. Air Force, and I think that's pretty interesting myself. Pretty neat guy. So he's telling me all about the plane, the, the F-22 that he's flying, telling me the virtues of the plane and so forth. This guy comes up and interrupts our conversation from down the street and just cut, butts into our conversation. I thought, well, maybe he knows the neighbor or something. And uh, I said, well, how are you, sir? He said, terrible! And I said, it always amuses me when people are doing terribly, I'm sad to say. Uh, I, I said, uh, well, what's wrong? He said, I was just doing fine until a few minutes ago and these two ladies had to come and ask me if I know where I'm going to go when I die. <laughs> and the pilot and myself look at him like, and that, and that made you so that you're doing terrible? I mean, what is so terrible about a question like that? What's well, terrible about, about it is that either he did not like the implications of the question or he didn't have good answers for the question. He didn't want to think about it. Listen to me, people. There are many individuals that don't want to think about the resurrection. The reason they don't want to think about the resurrection is because they'll realize that they need to do something about what they thought about. Some folks don't like it to know that, you know, I'm going to die just thinking about dying. Uh, you ever met somebody that just didn't want to talk about dying? Funeral directors will tell you most people make, make no preparation for their physical death. And they make a lot of money off of that. Funeral directors say, you know, most people have no plans to die. They don't plan to die. And you know, it could also be true that if people don't plan to die, they don't plan to live. Isn't it so? If you don't plan to die, you don't plan to be resurrected or you don't plan to come back from the dead. And here's the great deal about the crowd in this room here today. We're in a room of folks that aren't bothered talking about dying because of the resurrection. And that's the deal. Let's talk about the resurrection now, shall we? Let's talk about the implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First of all, I want to just mention that Jesus isn't the first person or the last person to be raised from the dead. Jesus wasn't the first person or the last person to be raised from the dead. Uh, if you were to go, you don't need to. We'll go to some other scriptures here in a little bit. But this morning, if you were to go to 1 Kings chapter 17, read verses 17 through 24. And again, you don't need to do that. Uh, if you're taking notes, you could jot it down. But you read about Elijah and uh, the widow's son that Elijah, God used to raise from the dead. <clears throat> and a little boy was dead, and this all that this widow woman had was her son. And Elijah through the power of the Holy Ghost, raised the widow's son from the dead. And Elijah is known as a great prophet. Elijah is the one who, through the power of God, called down fire from heaven. And so God greatly, mightily used Elijah. But if you were to ask what's the greatest thing that Elijah ever saw accomplished in his life, it would probably be that he raised a kid from the dead, wouldn't it? Let me ask you a question. Had you rather, if your family... Had you rather see fire come down from heaven and consume the sacrifice on the altar and burn the water out of the ditch? I'd like to see that, wouldn't you, from a distance? <laughs> or would you rather have a loved one raised from the dead? The second one. I'd have second. 
If you ever loved anybody, it'd be the second one, wouldn't it? And so that's a great thing. Probably the greatest miracle that Elijah ever did was when the widow's son was raised from the dead. Elisha prayed for God to give him a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And God used Elisha to do great things as a prophet for Israel and to do great miracles as a prophet for Israel. But there was a Shunammite woman uh, that Elijah lived with and had an apartment on her side of her house, and her son died, and God used Elijah to raise him from the dead. Elisha, I should say. And that's probably, if you and I were to just say, what would you rather see Elisha do? Would you rather see him make food last a long time? Or would you rather see him raise the widow woman's or the woman's son from the dead, what would you choose? I'd choose the resurrection, wouldn't you? Raising a dead young person. Elijah's bones were in a tomb, and a certain part of the year in uh, the, the region of Israel that they were in, raiders would come in, and they were ha conducting a funeral for a dead man, and uh, it was actually Elijah's grave, this is in 1 Kings chapter 13 if you want to read about it on your own time. They're conducting a grave and, and they see that these raiders are coming and so they end the funeral abruptly and throw him into a random tomb which happens to be Elijah's tomb, the dead man. And when he touches the bones of Elijah, Elisha, the dead man comes back from the dead. <laughs> That'd be something, wouldn't it? That'd be a great way to end a funeral. You know, I don't like the whole funeral pranks where you think someone's dead and they pop out of the casket and that sort of thing. But throw him in the grave and he comes out alive, I mean, that would work for me. That would be pretty neat, wouldn't it? Uh, the widow at, uh, at uh, was it Nate? Uh, I can't remember the name of the, of the, the city, but I think it's Nan, Nan, or, uh, Nan? How do you pronounce it? Anyway, it's in Luke chapter 7. You can look it up. But Jesus raised the widow's son from the dead. I think it's named. Um, Jairus' daughter. Remember the man? Jairus. Jesus raised his daughter from the dead. It was commonplace in the ministry of Jesus to raise people from the dead. What's the most well-known resurrection which Jesus performed? Lazarus. 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 Boy, I'm, I love it when I ask a question and people are either following along or they get the right answer. You realize, okay, so either I'm right about it and everybody agrees or at least we're communicating here today. So thank you for knowing the answer to that question. Lazarus. Last week, actually, last two weeks, we kind of looked at the resurrection of Lazarus. Remember the Palm, Palm Sunday uh, when Jesus went into Jerusalem? Right after that, of course, when he went into Jerusalem, the big deal was that people were coming to see Jesus, but actually the greater attraction was Lazarus. People were coming to see Jesus, but what they really came for was they'd heard Jesus had let raised Lazarus from the dead. That's John chapter 12 where that's at. And because of Lazarus being raised from the dead, the Bible says many believed and went after or followed Jesus. So because Jesus raised people from the dead, people followed Him or believed in Him. Now, I don't have to ask you what the greatest resurrection is. We all know the answer to it. We're celebrating it here today. It's when God raised Jesus up from the dead, right? And, and it's talking about resurrection. You know, there are resurrections after Jesus was raised up that the resurrections, the purpose of it, I believe, were illustrated in Acts to show the power that God's Holy Spirit was with the church, that God had validated the church. That that's what he's, he was using. And so there are a couple of individuals in the book of Acts that are mentioned as being raised from the dead. Uh, you know what? Before we get to that, though, I, I, I skipped a major one before Jesus' resurrection. And it was the saints that lived in Jerusalem. You remember when Jesus died on the cross and there was a big earthquake? And then the tombs opened and the saints came out of the tombs and went into the city. And Jesus raised up the saints and I believe He took them with Him. And they came up out of paradise. You study Luke chapter 16. You'd see that there's hell and there was paradise and that there was a gulf between the two. Well, believers, when they die today, saints and Jesus, when they sleep, or that's a word in the, in the Bible means death, when they die, uh, they don't go into hell and they don't go into paradise. Today they go to heaven 
to be with the Lord. But until the work of the cross, until the death of Christ was completed, there was still separation between man and God. So the saints were kept in a place called either Abraham's bosom or paradise when they died, and they were in a waiting place until the atonement of the cross, the, the paying for sin was taken care of by Jesus' death. And so the moment Jesus died, the graves opened and the saints came out. And where did they go? Well, they, they went up to heaven. God took them up to heaven with them. But first they went into the city and testified. There's life after death. There's resurrection. Then God raised up Jesus. And then in the New Testament of the Scripture, uh, there was a young lady by the name of uh, Tabitha that was raised from the dead, and that's in Acts 9. There was a young man, remember the guy that fell out of the window because Paul preached too long? And that's why we, we have first story, first floor churches now, just so you know. Uh, because when you all fall out of your seat, we just let you lay there. You don't usually die from it. <laughs> but, uh, but Paul was preaching, and Eutychus was sitting in a window, and he fell out of it, and it killed him. And uh, the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. That's in Acts chapter 20. And so one of the major implications that we could just draw from what we've discussed without even going to the text and reading the long text of the Scripture this morning is that there's life after death. There's life after death. In other words, the phrase, somewhere, forever, has a lot of meaning to both believers and to lost people. Now, I've had people try to philosophize and uh, begin philosophical about it and try to say things like, well, I don't believe there is life after death. You ever heard that there's no life after deathers? They don't go to funerals that way. I've seen the same people that say, I think you just die and go into the ground and cease to exist. I've seen those same people at funerals saying, well, they're still with us. Or, you know, I believe they're somewhere. Well, the truth of the matter is they're being more honest at the funeral than they are when they're having the discussion. They just don't want to talk about how to know that you're going to have eternal life or how you're going to have the resurrection. They just don't want to talk about it. But the fact is, is that if you read Romans chapter 1, what the Bible clearly writes, one of the things that you'll see from the Scripture is that God put in our hearts a knowledge, not only of Himself, but of His eternal nature or His Godhead. We're born believing that we're going to live forever somewhere. The question really is just where are you going to be? Because either you're going to live forever as God's enemy, or you're going to live forever as God's child in His presence. And those are implications of the resurrection we'll get to here in just a little bit. This morning, though, I'd like to look at a few things. Sometimes I've preached messages on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, about proofs of the resurrection. And by the way, there are plenty. For your own, uh, for your own benefit, sometimes think about. Think about the proofs of the resurrection. It's ludicrous to try to say that Jesus never lived or Jesus never existed when literally countries of people are celebrating the life of Jesus Christ even today. Matter of fact, there's not a greater event in the world than the celebration of Jesus the Passover Lamb and the resurrection. Today, is there? Is there anything bigger going on in the world than Easter Sunday? I was surprised this last week by how many people wish me a happy Easter. Even on the phone with tech people last week, people said, I hope you enjoy your Easter. About every store I went into last week, people said, Happy Easter, Happy Passover to me. Why is that? Well, it's because Jesus was the Passover lamb and he existed. So that I, I don't have a lot of time for the notion that Jesus never lived or existed. There's just too much going on as a result of his life for that to even be considered as a sane argument, isn't there? But sometime for your own benefit, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where not only in the, in the Gospels do we have a testimony of the resurrection of Jesus, but where Paul talks about how that he was an eyewitness of the resurrection. He saw the <coughs> resurrected Jesus. Uh, how that he talks about how that all the brethren saw Jesus. James and the twelve saw Jesus. And then he talked about how that thousands saw Jesus, but at one time more than 500 of the brethren saw Jesus at the same time. Now, it's easy for a person or a couple of people to make up a story. But anytime you add a second person to a made-up story, you introduce contradiction, don't you? 
it's actually incredible for people that have seen the same thing. And it's incredible when you just try to get an account of it to notice the different perspectives or things that people saw in the same thing. I can think of a good example of this some years ago. I don't know how long it was ago. Charlie, wake up so I can ask you a question. Okay, uh, some years ago, Charlie and I on a Sunday afternoon were out for a five-minute boat ride, literally, and we got hit by a guy in a jet ski that was speeding under a bridge. And he hit us really hard. Uh, we had to fill out an incident report with, uh, Flor was it Florida Wildlife? It was, wasn't it? FWC, about that incident when we got hit. And it was interesting reading Charlie's report and my report. I realized from Charlie's report that I'd passed out. Like, and I realized from his report that I'd said things I didn't remember saying. And as I thought back over it, Anthony was there too. And I asked Anthony, he said, yeah, that happened. And I didn't even remember it. Didn't even notice it. It was just interesting, the difference in my perspective and Charlie's perspective. And we were both telling the truth. Can you imagine somebody making up a lie and then spending their lives explaining the lie? How convoluted and contradictory it'd be? Well, try and explain 500 people at the same time being witnesses of it. Or thousands of people being witnesses of it. And in having say, any kind of coherent or cohesion, uh, or cohesiveness, like it being a together story. So the fact of the resurrection is one that historically is ind indisputable. It can't be disputed. It happened. So today we're not looking at the fact of the resurrection, we're looking at the implications of the resurrection. And since we're almost out of time, I'd like to just look at a couple of verses in the Scripture. So now would you please uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to look at one of the major implications of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'll just begin reading at verse 51. And I'm going to read to verse 58 and allow you to draw a lot of your own conclusions rather than expounding on the text. Paul said this to the church at Corinth. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Changed from what? Well, from having a corruptible body to an incorruptible one. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be a steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so the first implication of the resurrection is that for a believer there's no death. Now, in this context, the Apostle Paul is explaining to believers who have lost loved ones who were in Christ why it is that their soul left their body and their body was buried in the ground. And when he talks about we're all going to be changed and the dead will be raised, he's not talking about dead souls. He's talking about dead bodies which are on the ground because the souls never died. So death has lost its sting. See, the truth is, is that in this same passage, Paul describes the day of the rapture when there are individuals whose bodies are going to be changed without ever physically dying. And I'm looking forward to that day. I'm praying that the Lord Jesus returns before I have to physically die. Now, it isn't so much that I mind dying physically. It's just that I mind it a little bit. I don't want to die. <laughs> but the fact is, is that I'm not concerned about spiritual death at all. Not in the least bit, because I'm never going to die spiritually. Spiritual death is separation from God, and because of the resurrection, I'll never be separated from God. I don't have to fear death. And guess what? That is why today this group of people here don't mind talking about dying. I don't mind talking about it. Uh, I don't particularly enjoy when a person physically dies, when their body dies, but it doesn't worry me much when I know that they have eternal life because they don't spiritually die. They're going to be somewhere forever. Friend, I've lost dear ones. I've lost people that I love with all my heart. 
I think probably the dearest people on this earth that I lost would be my sister, who I was very, very close with, and probably my grandfather, who I was very, very close with. And I shed tears and I sorrowed, and my heart hurt when they physically died. But my friend, every time I think about the resurrection, I rejoice for them because when they physically died, they didn't die spiritually, and they instantly went to a better place than they are now. So for them, their physical death was a triumph. I've thought over the years, uh, it's been about five years since I've lost my sister, and every time we get together for Christmas or Easter or Thanksgiving as our family, you know, we always have a conversation, we start doing something, and we always think, I wish Jenny were here. And then I think, but she doesn't wish she were here. She's glad she's not here because of the resurrection. See, she never died spiritually. She's in heaven. She has eternal life. And the truth is, it would be a terrible thing for her to have to come back to a place that is corrupted and sinful like this world. <clears throat> and she doesn't miss me. The Bible says in God's perspective of time that a thousand years is as a day with the Lord and a day is a thousand years. And if you calculate it, if I live another oh, 30, 40, 50 years, if the Lord tarries and, and if I live that long, my sister uh, will have been without me in God's economy of time for seconds, a few seconds, and she hasn't even had time to miss me yet. She doesn't care. My grandfather isn't in heaven saying, boy, I miss my family. He's in heaven enjoying being in a perfect place, and he's enjoying having eternal life, and that's an implication of the resurrection because death lost its sting. It can't do anything to us. Listen, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But Jesus died on the cross for sin. And when He died for sin, my friend, He conquered it. He took our sin for us. He paid for sin for us. And when He was resurrected from the grave, we were able to have His life. We are able to be risen with Him. That's the implication of the resurrection. Is it a good one? I think so. Uh, go back, uh, or actually go with me if you don't mind uh, to, John, or to Romans chapter 4, if you could turn there. And I just want to look at another implication of the resurrection. It's connected, it's not so different. But Romans chapter 4, second implication of the resurrection is justification. Justification. And uh, I wish I could read chapters 1 through 4 of Romans so that you could come into the full context of what the Scripture is saying. But if you look toward the end of chapter 4, Abraham is... Uh, being described as saved by faith. And in verse 20, we'll read verses 20 through 25, Abraham, the Bible says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. So Abraham was saved by faith because he believed that God was going to do what God said He would do. Ultimately, that's the resurrection, even though Abraham could only see it through a cloud. He couldn't see the clarity of what Jesus Christ would do. In verse 23, Now it was not written for His sake alone that was imputed to Him also, but to, to Him. But notice this, this is an inclusion of us. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on Him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. The secondary implication we're looking at today of the resurrection is that we're justified. The word justified is another word for righteous. And if you're going to take the word righteous and make it not a noun but a verb, it would be righteous. And that word doesn't exist. The word for that is justified. Or just the word that comes from justification. But literally it means taking a sinner and imputing them. And imputing is something that's done to a person passively. That is, they don't participate in the action. It's done to them. And the implication of the resurrection is that God takes sinners and takes the righteousness of Jesus and imputes it on them. That is, He makes them righteous. And so when God looks at you, if you've received Jesus as your Savior, He looks at you like He looked at Jesus who had never sinned. God sees you as justified. You say, Pastor, how could any person, how could any person really go and be in the presence of a holy God? A person couldn't, unless they were justified. That is made righteous because of the resurrection. My friend, let me just be as honest and candid with you as I can be. 
The Apostle Paul described himself in the epistles as the chief of sinners. In other words, he said, best sinner in the world, that's this guy. And you read his record, you could say, yeah, he was a bad dude. He killed Christians. He persecuted Jesus. He was a bad guy. I, I, I probably am not there with the Apostle Paul, but if you take this room of people, let me just be candid with you, knowing my heart and yours, no, not, not yours, knowing my heart, I'd have to say I'm just probably the most wicked person here. I'm just a sinner. I was born a sinner. It's natural to me. But because of the resurrection, my friend, God looks at me and says, just like my son, justified. Amen. Justified. And if you know <clears throat> Jesus as your Savior, God looks at you the very same way. He looks at you like you're perfect. And I don't know about you, but it makes me want to jump up and down just a little bit. I, I'll probably break something if I do, so I won't. <laughs> but I feel it. I'm excited about being justified. The implication of the resurrection is that I'm justified. I'm righteous, just like God's Son, even though I don't deserve it, even though I didn't ever do anything but sin. God has justified me. Last implication of the resurrection this morning. If you go back to the Gospel of John in, verse, in chapter 14, I just want to read all the way down here. This is right before He went to the cross. And Jesus is convinced his disciples to be quiet and listen enough to understand that he's actually going to die. They just didn't believe that the Son of God, they didn't believe he was the Son of God, they didn't believe he'd die. And if you knew Jesus and you knew he raised people from the dead and he could do miracles, you'd know that nobody could touch him unless he allowed it, right? And so the disciples just believed, you yeah, know, be far from the Lord. Now you're not going to die. And they just, Peter rebuked him for saying that he was going to die. But Jesus is saying, I'm serious now. Listen to me. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be betrayed. And I'm going to die. And after three days, I'm going to be raised from the dead. And then in chapter one, or verse 1 of chapter 14, He said, let not your heart be troubled. Now, I've had people break it to me before that they're going to physically die. And I, they've said things to me like, let not your heart be troubled. Not those words. But you know what? I'm going to die. And it's going to be soon, and I want to let you know, it's whatever. And I'll tell you, the first thing I do is cry. First thing I do is my heart aches. And it hurts. And it's painful. And I've been there too many times. I Even thinking about it, I, I had those feelings come up. And Jesus told His disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm thinking, well, Jesus, you're going to prepare a place for me, but I had rather you were here instead. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, if, and if I go to prepare a place for you, uh, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Well, that's good news, isn't it? But he said, uh, that where I am, there you may be also. And then Thomas interrupts, you know, with the Lord, we uh, know whether, not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? My favorite verse, I think, in the Bible, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. I'm the way to get there. And boy, I'm glad I know Jesus because I wouldn't know how to get to the Father. I don't know where God is beyond the heavens. I don't know how to travel to where God is beyond the heavens. But Jesus is with God and Jesus is going to prepare a place and a way for us. And he goes on to say, uh, down further, if you you will look down uh, with me. Let me find the place that I want to go here, so I don't get too far ahead of myself. Uh, now let's let's go down to to verse nine. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou still not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then? Show us the Father. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. So Jesus said, the works that I do prove that the Father's in me, don't they? Now, verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall I do also, and greater works than these shall I do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, uh, I, will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son? If ye shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Now look with me down to verse 19. We're going to see the final implication 
of the resurrection. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, that last phrase, because I live, ye shall live. Hallelujah. Because I live, ye shall live. And here's the final, this isn't, these aren't all the implications. This is not an exhaustive list today of implications of the resurrection. We've exhausted our time, unfortunately, or we could go on forever. But the final implication we're looking at today is that Jesus said, because I live, ye shall live also. And that is applicable in two ways. First of all, this. If you've received Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says, he that believeth hath eternal life. That means you're alive right now. We're taught, we understand in the Scripture that we're born dead to God. We're born dead in trespasses and sins. We don't have any spiritual life in us. Now that's not to be mistaken or confused with being spiritual. Everybody's spiritually aware or spiritual, but not everyone is spiritually alive. You get born and have spiritual birth the time that you receive Jesus as your Savior. A few weeks past, we looked at that in John chapter 3 when Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Spiritual birth happens when you <coughs> simply acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose again. And you ask God for the eternal for eternal life because of believing in Jesus. God, I believe that who Jesus was and what Jesus did, and I want to receive the free gift of eternal life. And God gives you spiritual birth and His Spirit comes in you. It's real. It happens that way. And you have eternal life and that's the moment you're born. Everybody isn't born alive. I've had people say, oh, I'm born a Christian. No, you weren't. Now, you may be born into a religious family. You may have always been spiritually aware of God. But until you're born again, you don't have eternal life. But when you do, that phrase Jesus <coughs> said to His disciples, because I live, ye shall live also, kicks in and begins to take effect. Here's the implication of the resurrection with regard to this for this guy. I'm never going to die. There's never going to be a time when I am separated from God and God turns His back on me and I go into eternal judgment. It's never going to happen. I'm not waiting until I physically die to begin eternal life. I received eternal life the moment I was born again, and I'll never die. Amen. Never die. Now, here's the deal. Death loses its sting for me because of that. I don't have a death wish. The truth is, is that I enjoy living. I'm talking about this physical life, not just being born again, but I just think God's good and life is good. You could say, life is good to me, and I'd say, amen, I agree. Sometimes people ask me, how you doing? I say, I don't want to tell you. Because I don't want to make you feel badly about your miserable existence in comparison with mine. Because my life is good. And it really is. You know what? I, I don't mean that anybody has a miserable existence, but I wouldn't trade my life for anyone's. I just love the life God's given me, and I enjoy it. But the reality oftentimes sets in when I realize I'm not forever for this world. And I don't mind thinking about it. It doesn't bother me to think about it. I can talk about death. And you know why? Because I'm talking about physical death, not spiritual death. Because I live, ye shall live also. I'm going to live forever spiritually. I'll never physically die because of the implication of the resurrection. Jesus said, because I live, ye shall live also. We have a song in our hymn book. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know He holds the future. And life is worth the living just because He lives. And isn't that true? Because He lives, so do I! I'm alive forevermore. Now, I could go on forever and you don't want me to. <laughs> so we're going to end there this morning. But we're going to end with the conclusion of the th three things that we saw this morning when we looked at the implications of the resurrection. And that's a good idea, isn't it? So what do we see this morning that were implications uh, from the resurrection? I better look at my notes or I'll add some or take some away. Okay. 
uh, I had to subtract a lot of things I was going to look at this morning. First of all, uh, because of the resurrection, there's no more death. Second of all, because of the resurrection, we're justified. We're righteous. And lastly, because of the resurrection, because He lives, we also live. Those are the implications we've looked at this morning with a caveat, with an exception, and that is this. You must be born again. Do you hear me this morning? You must be born again. Now, I do not mean you must have had your parents baptize you. I do not mean this morning you must have attended church faithfully. I do not mean this morning you must have done good works. I mean this morning you must be born again. That's what Jesus said. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so, friend, everything I said this morning about the resurrection applies for me. And I trust and hope it applies for you, but that's not guaranteed unless you've been born again. You must be born again. You say, Pastor, but I believe all those things are true. Your assent doesn't make you be born again. Asking to be born again gets you to be born again. Do you see that? In other words, births aren't general. Not actually. You were actually, be, you were actually born. Whether it was accurately recorded or not, you were actually born at a particular time. And being born spiritually is the same too. I've had people say, well, I don't know exactly when I was born again. You know, I think it kind of happened gradually. No, birth doesn't happen gradually. It happens in an instant. It happens in an instant. And you know what happens. I'm not saying today that you need an hour or a minute, but you ought to know when you're born again because it's the birth you get a choice about. And if you haven't made a choice about spiritual birth, I don't mean to be unkind to you, but it's ridiculous to think that it just happened and you didn't make a choice about it. God's not going to force anyone to have eternal life. It's a free gift and it's freely offered, but it also needs to be received. And so that's the last implication of the resurrection this morning, isn't it? You have to receive it. And if you're here this morning, and you came here and you're excited about Jesus coming from back from the dead, and God raising Him up, and you're excited about eternal life, Man, praise the Lord, you ought to be. But it might be you came here this morning and just your, the thought on your mind was, you know what? I want to know a little bit more about the resurrection because I need to know what it means to me. Well, that's what it means to you. It means you must be born again. It means it's time to receive it. And so how do you do that? Well, let me tell you how a four-year-old can do it in case you think it's complicated. When I was four years old, I was born again. I came to a place when my parents convinced me that I was a sinner. I, I didn't think up to that point I was, although the evidence of supporting uh, sinfulness was overwhelming. <laughs> my parents could remember more than I can about it. But there came a time when I was asked the simple question of, but have you received Jesus as your Savior? And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Yeah, Jesus died on the cross. Yeah, I believe all these things. But I haven't been saved. And you know, after a little conversation, a little help, I prayed a simple prayer. And I said something like this, not these exact words, God, I want to be saved because of what Jesus did. In other words, it would be just like today, you looked at the implications of the resurrection, you said, you know what? I want that. I want eternal life. And I told God that, and God said, then you, have, you can have it. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's God's Word on it. And so I did, and God did. I called on the name of the Lord, and God saved me. And I've been saved forever. Eternal life's eternal, my friend. You can't lose it. I want to do that. Amen. Well, you're going to do it here this morning. Amen. So eternal life is eternal. And so let's take the time here this morning. If you've never done that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, while I pray, you tell God that. You say, God, I want eternal life. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. I want to be born again. Let's stop now for that, shall we? God, this morning, the implications of the resurrection are miraculous. And the truth of it is something that is positively overwhelming for each of us. And God, for each person that would be here this morning, that would say, you know what, I doubt, or I don't know, or I can't come
come up with a time that I received the gift of eternal life and made the resurrection personal. So all of its implications don't apply. I want them to apply. God, I want to be your child. I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want eternal life. If you're here this morning, before I finish my prayer, would you just right in your heart just say that to God? God, I, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I want to have eternal life. You say that right in your heart to God, my friend. God's word on it is that He'll do it. We're going to sing a song of invitation. So God, please bless and move in our invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet at this time this morning and open your, bio, your hymn books to page 243? 243. And while we sing the song of invitation, the reason we sing it is because the truth of it. There's room at the cross for you. And while we sing, if God's spoken to your heart and you have something to say to God or you want someone to pray with you, then my friend, would you take a minute during the invitation, instead of singing, would you talk to God and tell God uh, what's in your heart or respond to what God said to you? There's room at the cross for you. And let's go ahead and sing. If you need to come forward and pray with me, feel free to do so. Brother Andrew will step right up. Matter of fact, Andrew, why don't you step up and begin our, our invitation song this morning. There's room at the cross for you. All right? If you need, to, you need to respond in the invitation, you do so right now, would you? Amen. The cross upon which Jesus died is the shelter in which we can hide. And its grace so free is sufficient for me. As wide as the sea, there's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. But there's just not anything better than the resurrection, is there? Nothing better than knowing God's love for us. And if you're here this morning, maybe sometimes what happens in a service is more questions are left unanswered than answered because not everything can happen in 45 minutes or so of preaching. But it can happen for you. We've got Bibles and we've got time to spend with you to answer any questions that you would have. And you can be confident about eternal life. You can live forever because he lives and so let's sing that chorus uh, as we dismiss here today uh, we're just going to sing because he lives i can face tomorrow if you know it let's sing it together and then you'll be dismissed because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know, I know He holds the future, and life is worth the living just because He lives. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>